and they feel a very intense burning in the back of their knee or the back of their leg, right? Well, muscles being stretched are not typically burning in nature. They might be discomfort or stretch. <laughs> Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to our YouTube channel. My name is Dave Tilly, and I'm really excited today. We're going to talk about something I get a lot of questions about, which is hamstring flexibility or pike flexibility or compression mobility, kind of all that stuff together. We're going to dive into the exact things that can limit someone's flexibility leading to either soft tissue or maybe it's someone who really has a true hamstring limitation, which I think is sometimes a misconception or sometimes related to the actual position of their pelvis or some things that we miss a lot, sometimes related to the nerves. If you guys want to learn about this, stick around. We're going to dive deep into it. But if it's your first time to the channel, Hello, welcome. Or if it's the first time back in a while, please make sure you guys like and subscribe because we're getting a really big, exciting following for these kind of videos and they're helping a lot of people. We want to make sure that more people are aware of the information. Like and subscribe. And then also, if you've been following the videos, let us know in the comment section about what you like about this video or what you want to see in the future. The more we hear from you, the more videos we make that are really specific to what you're dealing with and we can help you more. Comment below, let us know your favorite part of this video or let us know what you guys want to learn more about in the future. Starting off here, I want to dive right into it about a couple things that are usually missed and sometimes overlooked and spend a lot of time with people kind of giving them headaches. The first thing I always start with, and I tell people about this, is that it is not just hamstring flexibility, right? Yes, you could possibly have some true hamstring stiffness, and we're going to talk about that, but there are many other things that could limit someone's ability to touch their toes or do a pike stretch or have better hamstring mobility. Maybe they want to deadlift. Maybe they want to do some other movements in the gym and they can't quite get a good hinge pattern. For whatever reason, unfortunately, I think the hamstrings just get automatic. Like, all oh, my hamstrings are stiff, static stretch them, and unfortunately, either people don't make progress or, as we'll talk about lower, sometimes they hurt themselves. Sometimes they make some really irritable soft tissue or neural tissue, and I want to explain what's going on there. So the first thing I really want to make sure we talk about is oftentimes someone's not limited at all by their true hamstrings. It's really the position of their pelvis, right? So we talked about this pretty extensively in another video, but this concept of anterior pelvic tilt, which is when someone's back is very overextended, so maybe they have some stiffness in the front of their hips, maybe they're their glutes are not strong compared to their quads. Maybe they have a balance of the internal and external rotators of their hips. So the adductors being more the internal rotators, there's no direct internal rotators of the hips. So the adductors help out along with some of the other musculature like the TFL, or maybe it's the outer hips not having enough strength to get them in a good proper hips under position. For whatever reason, if you're in a big arch position, what that does is it pre-tensions the hamstrings. So you can see here in my wonderful guy who's made his uh, journey back to the channel, if you are very limited and can't touch your toes, it could be that because you live so much in an anterior pelvic tilt, that when you go to lean forward and touch your toes, you feel a significant amount of hamstring stiffness and hamstring tone. Well, what that is is pre-tensioning of not only the tendon that attaches to your hamstring, but then also the actual musculature itself and some of the neural tissue that goes down the back of your leg, your sciatic nerve. If you're someone who has that overarch pelvis, it could very well be that the stiffness of maybe your hip flexors or your quads or your groin, as we talked about in the last video, are pulling you into that position of an overarched pelvis and it feels like your hamstrings are stiff but the problem is really in the front and so i see that a lot in athletes that i treat that are sprinting athletes or high level kind of circus and gymnastics athletes it's actually an issue with the front of their hips right so what you have to do is kind of go back to that video we talked about but screen yourself out and think about do you have mobility restrictions maybe in the front of your hips maybe your lower back is very very stiff like your paraspinals maybe you have some strength deficits in your hips or your external rotators right or maybe you have some just control and awareness problem that you're not really thinking about tucking those hips under and squeezing the core when you reach for your toes or do some compression work like in a handstand, maybe those are maybe the issues. It's not truly about what's going on in the back of your leg. I think that's very important to realize because a lot of athletes that I treat who kind of live in that overextended posture, their hamstrings are constantly toned up because they're trying to maybe pull them out of that position when they run because it's irritable for their hamstrings and stuff like that. I want you guys to think about that to begin with is realizing that when you look at the anatomy of the hamstrings, right, they start from the high pelvis, the ischial tuberosity, they run down the back of your leg. You have a couple different ones. You're biceps femoris, your semitendinosus, and semimembranosus, and they attach below the knee. A lot of the influences of the pelvis are going to change the dynamics of what's going on. There. That would be my first thing is actually screen out the front of your hips and look through that other video and ask yourself if you have an issue with pelvic tilt. If you could be, and you can try this experiment at home, stand up right now, overarch your pelvis a ton, try to touch your toes. I usually do it and get to about my knees and I feel like a pretty intense stretch or burning in the back of my leg. And then tuck your hips under as much as you possibly can, squeeze your glutes and try to retouch your toes. And you'll find that what you've done is probably 
probably gone a little bit lower. And that's not an issue related to the length of your hamstrings. It's an issue related to the actual position of your hamstrings. So if they're overarched, more tension, pre-tension in the hamstrings. If they're tucked under, you get a little more length to work with. And it could just be a matter of position and awareness. That's the number one thing to first think about. Okay, now to the actual people who maybe do have true stiffness in the back of their hamstrings, the way you're going to screen this out is by doing a leg raise test. So you lay on your back, you would point your toe. That's a very important thing. So plantar flex your toe. We'll talk about why in the next section, but just raise your leg up and see how far you can go. And generally we'd like to see someone get to about 70 or 80 degrees, but if their bottom leg starts to spin out or bend their knee and they can't go each way and you've ruled out hip flexor issues or, you know, groin issues on the front leg, then you maybe are limited by true hamstring stiffness in the back of your leg. But again, keep the toe pointed. That's very important. I'll talk about why and just see how high you can go. You can kind of put a pole next to your leg and see if you can get with to 90 degrees. That would be ideal. But if you can't really do a nice position of split pelvis, 70, 80 degrees, it might be hard to touch your toes or kind of get into that proper hinge pattern. So if you do truly have some posterior chain stiffness, which in this context, we talk about maybe the posterior hip, we talk about the hamstring itself, we talk about some of the soft tissue involved there. What can you do if you have an issue truly? So the number one thing I start people with actually is more of a hip mobilization, because I think sometimes it's not only about the hamstring touching, but they don't have a hinging ability, right? Hinging is when you kind of bend your knees slightly and drive your hips back towards the wall behind you, and you're really pushing your femurs back in the hip sockets this way. So sometimes people have an issue with being able to get their hinge pattern backwards, and that limits their ability to kind of do a deadlift or touch their toes or stuff like that. I actually like thinking about screening this out with some external rotation and hip flexion tests on the table, but I really like a quadruped glute mobilization. And you go on hands and knees, we'll put a video up for this, but you kind of lock one leg in and you're not actually thinking about a pigeon stretch. You're thinking about keeping the back very, very neutral, sliding your hips to the side as far as you can, and then rocking your hips back while still keeping that flat back. And oftentimes people feel a very intense stretch in the back of their butt. And what we're doing there is we're trying to mobilize the hip backwards in the hip joint. I think unfortunately, sometimes people just do a really deep pigeon stretch and they get away with really mobile external rotation. They don't actually put that hip joint in a better position to slide backwards and mobilize the back of the hip. So I really love that quadruped rocking mobilization. I would definitely try that one. Kind of touch your toes, do the quadruped rocking on both sides, and then retest your toe touch and see if it changes anything. Some people get a really big improvement. I don't think we're actually stretching out the capsular tissue. I think we're just mobilizing and kind of calming down some of that area and desensitizing it. So that would be the first thing that I start with. But also, if you do have true hamstring stiffness limitations, what we can do is follow the principles and the concepts we've talked about from other videos because we know there's some decent research to support that consistent soft tissue work and stretching every single day done to tolerance and done regularly is going to help us with some desensitization of the musculature, maybe calm down some of those nerves we talked about called nociceptors. So soft tissue work to the hamstrings and also doing a little bit of mobilizations. I really like leg lowers for this exercise. So laying on your back, pull one leg up, let the leg slowly drop down, hold it for a second and then bring it back up. I like that mobilization because it's a little bit more active and it kind of involves the core being on, not just passively doing a static stretch. Now there's nothing wrong with doing a static hamstring stretch, um, but I think sometimes it's not as really effective to the mobilizations we're going to do. So try to do some leg lowers. I really like just doing some hinging drills. Just put a back dowel on your wall, squat slightly and drive those hips back and do a set of those to warm up because you can sometimes mobilize the hamstrings as well, kind of from the top, whereas leg lowers maybe are the entire hamstring length itself. So I really like that to do, but also we talked about how important eccentrics are. So eccentrics have some decent research behind them to kind of increase. Maybe we're continuing to desensitize the nociceptors. Maybe we're doing a little bit of actual uh, stretching to the area, which causes the body to kind of turn over some new uh, cells to try and increase the length of that muscle. There's some argument in the research about whether it's more sarcomere genesis or whether it's mere, you know, collagen blackout, you know, for a second, if you're not a nerd, but some epigenetic expression of the collagen tissue, whereas the mechanical transductive loading causes the body to kind of feel like, whoa, that's an intense stretch. The signal of stretching to the cell maybe goes to the nucleus, turns over some more uh, epigenetic factors that change the amount of collagen that's being put out or some of the elasticity tissue. Not really sure. It's still up for debate in the research, but it's a fascinating area that I'm still reading about. So maybe that's what's happening. We don't really know. But what we like to do for the eccentrics is we want to do a five, a loaded movement. So I like loaded RDLs here and doing a five second lower, a five second bottom hold, and then putting the legs together and coming back up to the top for five reps. I think I really find success when adding that into people's programming. So do some single leg RDLs that might be helpful, right? I'll write that down just to make sure people are aware. RDLs here. And then also when you do these things, you have to make sure it's consistently done together. I think that's what we know from the research. Consistently doing something every single day, maybe five to six days per week is better than one crazy intense hour long mobility session. Go through those, check out the anterior pelvic tilt. If you do have true hamstring stiffness from that screen, work on some of those things. 
but there's something here that I think oftentimes gets overlooked, right? So what we have is sometimes we have neural tissue, we have these nerves that go from our lower back all the way down the back of our leg, right? So what we can sometimes have is called adverse neural tension, okay? And nerves typically don't love to be really aggressively stretched. They also don't like compression for long periods of time. So what happens sometimes when people go to touch their toes, because the toes are up, right? This nerve runs from your lower back all the way down the back of your leg and wraps around your foot to your big toe, the sciatic nerve and all the branches that kind of spin off that. So sometimes what happens is when people are doing hamstring mobilizations, they dorsiflex their toe, put a band around their foot and pull that up towards their body. And they feel a very intense burning in the back of their knee or the back of their leg, right? Well, muscles being stretched are not typically burning in nature. They might be discomfort or stretch, right? But they're not going to feel like, you know, they're tingling or they're having some pins and needles. Oftentimes what's happening is someone is actually doing a nerve glide. They're pulling up with their toes up and they're rounding their back. And sometimes their head is up off the ground and they're pulling so hard that they're causing some neural tension. I've actually had some patients of mine who have low back discomfort flare up a sciatic uh, irritation or flare up their low back because they're doing such intense stretching. And the way you screen for this is you definitely want to use a medical provider's assistance, but lay on your back and this medical provider can dorsiflex your toe, straighten your knee and have you relax your head and bring your leg all the way up and then see how you feel. They let go of your toe and flex your toe down into plantar flexion and you change your tingling, you change your burning sensation. Well, you haven't changed the length of your hamstring. You've just changed the actual nerve tension that's going on in the back of your leg. So by getting to a point and letting go of the dorsiflexion and seeing if that changes your symptoms of hamstring stiffness kind of shows us that it's maybe more of a neural issue in that adverse neural tension. It's not actually your hamstring. And you can make that more intense by doing, you know, some tests that David Butler's put out, but like neural tension of dorsiflex, bring the knee up straight, cross the body and internally rotate and go across the body into adduction. That kind of wraps the sciatic nerve around the, the outside of the femur. And that may cause some intense stretching. You let go of the foot, maybe you bend the knee, you change it and that changes the actual, you know, tingling itself. So again, that's telling us that it is the sciatic nerve that's involved, it's not so much the hamstring itself. I see a lot of people doing these pike stretches, pulling their toes up, reading over, feeling very intense tingling. And what they don't realize is they're actually maybe causing some irritation of their sciatic nerve. It's not stretching their hamstring. What we do for these people with the medical provider's assistance is we do some neural glides, right? And what we can do here is you lay on your back, your toe comes up and your knee is bent. What we're doing is we're flossing the nerve back and forth as it kind of goes forward. If I'm bending my knee and pulling my toes up, I'm slacking the joint at the knee where the sciatic nerve crosses and I'm stretching it at the foot. So as I straighten my leg up to the ceiling and I point my toe, I've now slacked the nerve at my toe and I've straightened it out my knee. So it's kind of putting tension on it there. So essentially you're doing a tug of war between the knee and the ankle joint of flossing the nerve back and forth. You're not actually pulling on it from a max tension point of view. Oftentimes we'll have people do a toe touch, do 20 to 30 nerve glides on each side, trying to work on shooting their toes up and working on the knee and the ankle alternating bending. They stand back up, they touch their toes, they have a ton more mobility, right? And again, just because we calm down the nerve a little bit and stop yanking on it, it's not actually related to the hamstring mobility itself. I see that as a very common error a lot of people make both on the medical side and then also on the training side. And I just want to make people aware of that because that is a huge different problem <laughs> than someone who has true stiffness of their hamstrings or even someone who has some mobility and strength deficits above. So keep that in mind, get that screened if that's something you maybe think you have. Lastly, down here, when it comes down to some of the core or loaded movements, sometimes like a press handstand where you want to get your hips more in a compression or you want to get yourself more compressed for some sort of skill, it actually has more to do about core strength than it has more to do about passive hamstring flexibility. Some compression work is really, really helpful here. And something I really, really like is seated leg lifts. So you're on the floor, sitting in a little bit of a straddle or a pancake, your hands are flat on the ground and you just do some leg lifts. You work on compression of the core to tuck your hips under. Sometimes people actually don't have as much issue with the mobility aspect, but they actually do the strength part. Their lower core is not strong enough to tuck them under. So they default back to that kind of arch position. And that usually is something that, that is a big problem for higher level athletes trying to work on, like I said, press handstands or you know different advanced sporting movements. So if you find none of these things are the issue when you're trying to touch your toes, maybe think about how strong your core is. Maybe think about the control of your core down into that side. And then lastly, above all else, unfortunately, the, the elephant in the room that many people don't want to deal with is that they are lacking consistency. They are not really dedicated to doing a daily 15 to 20 minute mobility program to work on maybe some of the hip flexors or some of the hip hinging or some of the eccentrics or work on those neural glides. They go to the gym, they do a couple quick stretches, they jump right into the workout, they try to deadlift, they don't have the mobility, it doesn't feel so hot. So really what you need to do is you need to screen these things out and figure out what is my problem and then break those down into a consistent daily practice you do every single day. Work on the drills, work on the mobility stuff, work on the progressions and don't just leave it on the shelf for like once a week or twice a week. I don't think we're going to make any positive changes there. A little bit of an explanation there into some possible factors of why somebody always has bent knees, why they can't do a pike stretch, why they can't do a hinge pattern, all these kind of things ranging from the recreational fitness to like the elite gymnasts that I work with, why their knees always bent. You want to make sure you're looking at some of these things. Now, there are some other things people talk about like calf flexibility and ankle flexibility, but I think oftentimes these ones are the bigger fish to fry. So I would start here.
here before you do anything else. Hopefully that was helpful. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. And again, do us a favor, like and subscribe so you get updates and notifications for all of our content. We really enjoy hearing from you. Thank you so much for checking out this video and being a part of our community. We value you guys a lot. Jump in the comment section. What did you like the most about this? What did you find surprising? And what do you want to learn about down the road? Thanks.